we are in the home of uh, a veteran who is not just a veteran in the media, but also one who has carved a niche for himself in the political terrain. I mean, there's no how you can talk about the history of Nigeria without mentioning our own Chief Olushegu or Shoba. Aremo Oshoba. So it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you so much for having us in your Thank home. You. Yeah. Now, um, you're 83 years old, and anyone see you, because I saw you alight from your entrance there, and I saw you, and I was like, wow, 83 looks so good on you. And I'm wondering, what is that secret that's kept you looking this young? I always tell people that um, the first thing is the grace of God. Uh, God has given me the grace to live this long. And of course, um, I must also confess that in life, in whatever one does, one should always bear in mind that everything must be done in moderation. Everything I do, I do them in moderation. Whether food, uh, phone, whatever it is, I caution myself to be moderate. Uh, and of course, uh, I must confess to you, I've never taken anything alcoholic in my life, not even wine. I don't smoke. Uh, uh, my, some of my classmates, one of my classmates is my doctor, and he said perhaps some of the things that has helped me, because I didn't join them in my younger days in high school, uh, freaking away, smoking and drinking, and uh, keeping myself, even though rascally, uh, level-headed. Um, and lastly, I thank God for giving me the spirit of being contented. Um, contentment is very, very important. Um, I don't envy anybody. I don't look at other people as a benchmark for my own life. And I always tell people I don't pray to have an aircraft at this age. I want it for my children and the younger ones after me. When they have it, I can always take a ride on the aircraft. So my ambition is uh, also limited on in, in moderation. Hmm. So speaking of this moderation you talk about, do you also uh, play politics in moderation? Yes. Uh, I, I don't play uh, my own politics as a do or die. Uh, matter. And the uh, people always wonder. Uh, I have colleagues who veer from being on my side, go against me, go on the other side, and all kinds of things happen, and they come back again, and um, we carry on as if uh, it's business as usual. I don't hold grudges. I don't hold malice. I hate to uh, carry it in, in my mind overnight because if I have issues that is bothering me, I, I don't sleep well. So I try hard not to carry prejudices and malice and envy. They are, they are very important for good health. Hmm. You know, you also mentioned something now about um, not taking alcohol, that like you never taking alcohol. Never. I mean, that, that's not an information that will just pass and slide like that. I mean, given your profession, in those days, it was a given that any core <laughs> professional must at least take something that will keep them high and keep them, you know, up in the height where they can think and reason. I mean, that is the philosophy that was binding on most of those practitioners back in the day as journalists. You are absolutely right. Uh, my mentor, Elijah Jose, uh, used to tell me that... Uh, he wonders whether, whether I'm really a complete journalist. So is there a particular reason why your abhorrence for alcohol is that strong? Is there a reason why you so much stay away from it? You when I was young, my father, as a Degba man, and growing, growing up in Oshubu within the Degba community, the drink or schnapp was very popular, popular with, the, with our parents. And my father would take a sip of the uh, snap and 
use it like restraint in the mouth. And I just didn't like the, the smell. And so my father never, never asked me to clean the glass for him. I think I, I grew up not to like alcohol right from my youth. Can we have a, just a, a glimpse of um, your growing up days? My growing up days uh, were very interesting. Uh, I grew up in Oshobo within an enclave of uh, Egbaz who created uh, an area for themselves in Oshobo called Egbatedo. Egbatedo is the, the means the Egbaz created this area. And um, I never related much with the indigenous of Oshobo but more with the Agba community, the Vons, the Daudu, Famiwa, Koka, all of us Agbas. And um, I'm lucky. Uh, I learned to be streetwise at that time, which helped me uh, in my later days. Uh, in those days, uh, Yoruba culture, the, when you get into a roundabout, all the three corners is where they put the rituals. And then um, they will put the rituals for the, the divination and then put some coins there. At that time, farding, it was small, small farding. And we used to go around, pick the fadings, and buy bean cake and enjoy it. And uh, some of my colleagues used to fear that they will incur the rot of the cause of the deity that the people are putting this in the roundabout are trying to appease. But I never cared. And um, this was part of the rascality we played. And when I was young in school, um, during Christmas Eve, we would go quietly to the church vestry, take out the drums and all the and even though our parents would know that we had gone to uh, corner the church door, the woman, we play songs and things around the, and they give all little, little bits of things for Christmas. And there I developed this uh, street wise attitude. Mm. Uh, even going into where in those days, the masquerade, the, in Yoruba we call it the ballet, the in conclave of the masquerade. Um, and I go there because uh, it, it, and my, our parents must not know. And we will go and join them and uh, have a feel of the celebration. So all this, I always tell people that it's always good to let your children have moderate, sweet, wise exposure. exposure. Uh, not the modern day cultism and drug. In our days, there was nothing like cultism and drug. It just had a little bit of rascality. Hmm. And uh, in my later days, it has been of tremendous help. Uh, built me up to be courageous. Uh, gave me the feeling of uh, high confidence. All this little, little piece of uh, rascality and streetwise, uh, they are important in the development of uh, our, in, in our, in our development as youth. Would you have encouraged your children to be a bit of uh, rascals? I mean, now that you're a parent. Oh, yes. One, one of my children um, <clears throat> went to some of the best university in UK. And in his spare time, he, he, he's a DJ. <laughs> Gives himself the nickname of Sparrow. And um, he has, he has, he's, a, he's an executive in the company. And he travels around the, the whole world to go and do DJ for people. So would you say he got that, uh, he, that bug beat him from oh, where? When oh, did, yes, of course. When did he get that thing my wife said, in, in, my, in my younger days, as a, as a reporter, and that's why I just said advised me. My house was a clearing house for social, social engagement. On Saturdays, um, I used to have parties almost every Saturday. 
the likes of uh, General Muhtala Mohammed, General Babangida, uh, Air Marshal Abbas, uh, General Ikewachuku, those are the days of the military. Uh, there are two white Danjuma. My house was a clearing house. If you go to a party on the weekend and the party is not um, giving us the vibe and the fun, uh, we just say, let's move to Shekwa Shopasa because I have, and in those days, I had the best sound system. Mm. And uh, the latest release of music anywhere in America or UK, my friends abroad will send it to me. So I, I was up to date in terms of uh, latest sounds, latest releases, and uh, my house was a clearing house. Mm. And that's how I developed strong contacts with people. Just also for the records, where were you born and what schools did you attend? I was born in Oshobu on a Saturday, July 15, 1939. And um, my parents had had problem with uh, previous uh, deliveries, they died young, and that's why they gave, gave me the name Uluwa Shegu. Uh, this one is victory. God is going to be victorious on this one. That's the meaning of Uluwa Shegu. And then um, I grew up in Oshegu. The nearest school to us then was African Church School, walking distance from the house. And from there, I moved to Lagos got admitted to Methodist Boys High School, the second oldest secondary school in Nigeria. The Semes Global School is the oldest secondary school, Methodist Boys High School, founded in 1878, was the second oldest secondary school in Nigeria. And from there, uh, I, uh, I moved into, uh, I went to work in Lagos City Council, I mean, because then my Sunday school teacher was an assistant engineer in city council. And in those days, uh, these were mentors. Mm. Uh, just after school, I just taken into city council. And from there, I went to do my advanced level privately. I didn't go to HSC for two years. I did it within one year. I then joined three times. From where I just now threw me into the University of Lagos to go and do a diploma. and sent me to UK for another diploma course. You see, I started having a series of training. And um, that's how I came into journalism. I was supposed to go and read law, according to the advice by my favorite teacher, uh, Chief Oshinaye. So how did you uh, find yourself in journalism? Was it accidental? Was it deliberate? Was it calculated? What was your first encounter and how did it happen? What triggered this love, this unalloyed love for, for journalism? I would say, it's, you know, in those days, your teachers, our teachers had influence on us. Oshina was saying that she go and read law, and um, <clears throat> I like just say was very close to my guardian, Leyama Konju. Uh, I like just say, well, look, I wanted to upgrade the standard of those uh, entry into journalism. We wanted those who have other advanced level or who had done HSC. And the three of us, um, Ajayi, Shunaike, and myself, were taken in to be trainee reporter. And there was an expatriate who was supposed to be a teacher. You see, the training there was on the job training, like articleship. We will go with senior reporters to uh, assignment and events. The senior reporter will give their report to the newsroom, we will give our own to the trainer. Along the line, the trainer found that my own report were more detailed, more professional than my senior. And this report got to Elijah Jose. And uh, the training that we were, we were to have for three months, Elijah Jose immediately pulled me out. And then, um, I thought I was going to do it as a uh, holiday job to now go to the University of Lagos uh, in September. I joined the times on June 8, 1964, with the mind that September I will now go and read law. What I just said it was 
By the time I was to start, there was a program for journalism in the University of Lagos. He just sent me on that program and aborted my entry into the University of Lagos to go and do law. And that was how I just said, now, uh, pull me out of journalism. Even though I then decided to now go and do evening law. Again, he aborted it. Within a year after uh, coming out of the University of Lagos, he sent me to UK on the scholarship by the Commonwealth Press uh, Union. So I like said had a great, tremendous influence. He, 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 he saw what I would call, uh, he saw ahead and encouraged me. Then my editor there was um, Peter Nahuru. Within two months of my starting with data, Peter now wrote uh, a commendation and said that if I continue to ap apply myself to details at this stage, that the sky will be the limit. He predicted it two months after I joined data. So you see, I had all this encouragement from um, my bosses. And that was, that was it. Did you ever think, reconsider going back to study law? No, at all. As God will have it, there were stories that became exclusive to me. I'll give you an example. There was an incident in the then Kingsway store. The Kingsway store in those days was the equivalent of suffrages, these major stores all over the world in Nigeria. And there was an expatriate who abused a lady by slapping her. Why the other pastors were killing the story? I, I wrote the story for the test and, and now it became a big headline. So somehow, uh, I developed the idea of investigating journalism early. And that led to the, July 5th, uh, to the coup of uh, January 15, 1966, which was barely a year after I joined the times, or, or two years. Uh, that uh, led to the death of uh, both the then Prime Minister, um, the minister, uh, Prime, Premier of Northern Region, so many people, and then Kotebo and Co. And because of my connections with the, what they call Central CID then, Criminal Investigation Department of the Police, who were investigating the whole thing, I was able to stumble through persistent investigation questioning and following up to not discover the uh, place where the bodies of this eminent Nigeria were placed. And that suddenly threw me up in journalism. And um, it was a uh, major breaking point in my career. And that's it. At that point, uh, I had no regret whatsoever of thinking of going back. By that time, I had aborted the idea of even reading law. Even <laughs> many years after, that's, that's passion for journalism. It stands out. Even in the way you talk, it stands out. And for me, it's very inspiring because from all indication, even when you leave journalism, journalism is not leaving you. It's, it will always be there with you, you know, for as long as you live and breathe and even beyond. Was there a time where you felt threatened, you know, as a journalist? Because, of course, you were digging deep into places where you shouldn't be putting your nose. And there you were, eliciting information that were hither though classified. And the question is, how were you able to get some of this information out there such that you were still alive to tell the story? I thank God that I survived because um, the security agencies have always seen me as uh, a serious security risk at all times. I'll give you some examples. As I said, I like just sent me to UK on scholarship of the on Commonwealth President's scholarship um, in 1965. By the time I came back in 1966, 67, by the time I came back, 
the Biafra war, uh, the Ojukwa had broken away. And I arrived on the, those days, coming back from UK, you was very, it's a celebrated issue, you know, you come back by ship, vessels, you know, Oriel, mm -hmm. and I via Papa, I via Oriel, um, two weeks on the ship, I came back from UK. And to come back from UK in those days on study was a big celebration. And the family had organized a celebration to welcome me. I didn't know that security were waiting for me in my house. By the time I got home, I was arrested. But the civil war had started. The then uh, CID department, then headed by, I think, uh, MD Yusuf. The war, uh, they, they saw me as somebody who had links. And maybe I don't know how they think I would be a threat. So I was arrested. And then, then uh, Late Shinkafi, who became the head of S uh, DSS and everything, was a French police officer, was the one that interrogated me. It's a good thing that I had left the reception, otherwise, it would have been a terrible bad moment that just arrived from England and I now ended up in uh, uh, detention. But I was detained overnight and I did the following My family didn't know until I came the to tell the story the following day. The war was on. And in Namdi Azikiwe landed suddenly at the airport on the way to Liberia to go and have a meeting with Gawan. And Gawan now insisted that they should bring him to the Barak. And through my contacts, I got information that Zika landed. And I went to the airport to go and cover it. And while I was waiting at the uh, then VIP lounge for Dr. Namdi Azikiwe to now come back from Dodon Barak to now continue his journey to Liberia, the Nagawa now phoned the VIP and I picked the call. Now I said, Ashegu, how, did he, how has it gone? Is uh, Dr. Azikwe now? Uh, I said, yes, he, the plane is just taken up. He wanted to get the first hand report of how this had gone. And I went and put this in my story. And you know, those around the head of state then said, ah, it's, it's bad for his image to have, be talking to a reporter to be asking about information, and, and got arrested again. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I, I've always had issues with the security agencies, and uh, they decided to go and close down three times under Gawan. And that's why General Gawan and I are very close, because I've had all kinds of experiences with him, and we, we reminisce and talk about it. And, uh, you laugh now, about it now. But you see, as a good reporter, you know, you don't release more than up to 0.01% of what you know. And that's why my contacts have absolute confidence in, in me because I get to know so much that I know where to draw the line. I'll give you two examples. When Papa Ola was released from prison, there was a upheaval in the then western region. The hunters uh, came under the umbrella of Agbekoya, that the hunters are resisting oppression. That's the meaning of Agbekoya. And they had held the whole of western region to ransom. It was only Chief Aulo who could break the difficulty the government was facing in losing control of the Western region. So Chifaolo now had to go and meet all the Agbekoya in their conclave. He was the only one who could do it. And I was one of the few reporters he took along. And that was how I came to be very, very close to Chifaolo in 1967. Because that time was the paper in Nigeria. And even though I was with him, observe all the discussion all the meetings, I didn't release 99.9% .9 of what I, I knew. It's only a tiny part of it. And I always came to appreciate my ability not to release too much that could have caused more havoc. And that was how I would, and I 
became very close. And I'll give you another example. I was very close to many, many of the parallel secretaries, and they'll tell me stories. They'll tell me things going on. And I, I, I wrote a lot of exclusive stories, all kinds of scandals. But you, nobody who had ever been in my contact had ever been in trouble for giving me information. The only person who told me pointedly is late general Emmanuel Abisoye. There was a coup that overthrew General Gawan while he was in Nairobi for OAU conference. conference. And um, there was a tense meeting at Dunham Barracks where Mutala Mohammed was now made the new head of state. And that day, there was a vacuum almost all day. The coup was announced by Jogaba in the morning, and we didn't know where we were going. No head of state, which is, is unusual. I mean, you don't create a vacuum in the country as soon as when uh, Kedi was shot. I think uh, Lindy Johnson was sworn in, in the aircraft. You don't create a, a vacuum. All day there was a vacuum. Then, because they, they, they were having a Supreme Council meeting in the Dodon Barrack, uh, I think they had some little problem about the condition under which Mr. Lamama wanted to accept to be head of state. And they obviously gave me a rundown of what had happened, details of what, what had happened. And, uh, you know, Abisoye was, you know, a man very blunt, honest, direct, can be over direct in his approach to things. So I, I became confused even as I was deputy editor of the time at my level. The information I have are too, too details, too much. And I said, Jera, how much of this can I use? He said, go and use your discretion. But let me tell you, if you run into trouble, I will. I will back you up. 99.9% of it are, all, are in my head. You haven't released them yet, even at this age? Oh, yeah. There are certain things you don't say out. Too many things. I mean, if you look at my book, what has power between us and Robert Sojo in 2002, 2003, uh, I released those that uh, I can release. There are still others that I still. Maybe I may still write a second book. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, so tell us about the uh, civil war. I mean, you covered the civil war, and of course, you must have that first hand experience of it and how it, uh, it affected you, your perception of that civil war and the take homes from that civil war as a journalist. It, this civil war was unnecessary, was most unfortunate. A lot of us young people, and most Nigerians supported the Juku. Uh, what most Nigerians wanted was a kind of confederation, uh, not a breakup. That was where, uh, unfortunately, Ujuku trailed uh, off. Uh, missed the point. Uh, I mean, even the then Biafra was not totally one body. The South South people were not totally in full support of the Biafra situation because you know when you take areas like uh, uh, the the current cross. Cross the river state, river state, Bayasa, um, Delta. Delta. They were, um, they were not all too comfortable because the core Biafra Ibu is landlocked, and that was the beginning of the failure of the uh, Biafra thing. But it was painful to us because those of us who saw what transpired, like take for example, young girls then became what they call attack trade. Attack trade is where they allow young men to go and hobnob with soldiers and things, get out for and they were abused. I didn't like it. And when you see um, the devastation, the destruction, it was very painful. I covered what the what the, what was called program at that time when Ibu were massacred in the north. I was sent to Kanu to go and I can I couldn't believe it where neighbors were killing Ibos, and they were all the body littering the streets in Kano. I mean, 
which one am I going to talk about? Is it to see the body of Tafa Balewa and Okotebo, or is it the civil war experiences, or is it uh, when the attempted coup by Dimka took place, and uh, myself and the then secretary of the government of Kwara, uh, Chief Obatu Imbu, Peter Ajayi, and myself had to go and retrieve the body of Colonel Taiwo on the way to Ofa. I mean, too many gory experiences. Uh, well, in old age, I've overcome the nightmares, but these are things, too many, that I don't want to be talking about. So you mean you had nightmares for, for a long yeah, occasionally time? Occasionally, I remember, and it's, it's not comfortable. And so for those people who are drumming the, the sound of war, I mean, haven't seen what you've seen, what will you be telling them in very short terms? I was telling my wife, the for study, and I said, when you see me preaching moderation, it's because I've seen it all. I know that we have to get to the point where there will be self-determination. And I've been preaching to my wife because you know, she's to an extent a militant in some of her approach that um, the kind of Nigeria we have now is definitely not the kind of Nigeria that all of us want. There must be true, genuine federalism. <clears throat> I'm happy now that the northern governors are beginning to see the light. Now, as a veteran, you have seen the Nigerian media evolve. I mean, from your time and uh, all the way to, to today, as we know it. What would you say have changed and what would you have wished changed, you know, for the better? Modern day journalists are far, far better educated and exposed than we were, but they are not as dedicated. When, when I see the uh, writings of people who claim to have degrees these days, I'm shocked. Secondly, we were not as materialistic as our young people today. But I can still say that Nigerian journalism, I'm proud to say, we are still one of the best in the world. We can match anywhere in the world. We can match people anywhere in the world. It's just that um, the online bloggers are the greatest headache that we have. Many of them are not trained. Uh, one lady calls herself investigative journalist. Um, I laugh. What does she know about investigative journalism? She has no training. She doesn't know uh, how to keep information, what to keep and what not to keep. I saw all the things she releases on her, her blog. A terrible thing that you should not even uh, release. Uh, many of them are fake. So the uh, problem that we have all over the world now is the issue of fake news. You talked about how you know, journalism is now. In your time, you were well paid. <coughs> and so it wasn't a function of materialism. But it would seem today most of these journalists would have to source for their pay from where they work. In the sense that sometimes when they go out like that, their views and opinions are colored by the con color of the currency that is being shoved at them. So how do you begin to correct this ill that has bedeviled the profession? In my time, we had the brown envelope syndrome. It's nothing new at all. Yes, you are right. Um, we were reasonably paid. I, I won't say well paid, but we were uh, contented with whatever we were able to get. Uh, unfortunately, many of my colleagues suffer for it in their old age. Many of them didn't have any investment, so they don't even have a roof over their head. And I feel sorry that some of my colleagues in old age uh, didn't live the kind of life 
that I would have loved them to live in. But you see, the problem is this. Yes, today, a lot of uh, media outfit, one, aren't paying salary regularly. You don't pay good salary. I had been that problem. And that has led into um, a lot of corner, cutting corners and compromising to survive that I accept. Uh, there will be need to look into this issue. And we, did, we do debate it regularly. You talked about not giving away uh, information. And as a journalist, it's your role, it's your prerogative to share information with the public because you are the news agent. You are the one that disburses this news. You are the one that, you know, you, you get this news and you're supposed to share. But you are saying, on the contrary, that, uh, in fact, out of 100% of what you have, you keep it, you keep 99 or 95 or whatever percentage, 90% of it, you will have it stored. Isn't that, won't, some people would call that being selfish because now you're holding information from the public that you're supposed to be feeding with information. How would you re respond to that? You must realize that there are certain information that can trigger uh, unimaginable upheaval. I'll give you an example. Uh, I had a late colleague, Onobanjo, who was the correspondent for French news agency, AFP. He got, an information was sent that some northerners had been killed in Port Harcourt. The story was sent to AFP. AFP as a news agency worldwide, like Reuters in those days, and the Associated Press in America, beamed the story out, which was false. The, other, the story was not checked. The Dardanelles went after the Igbos, and that was the beginning of the Nigerian civil war. As a journalist, you must know those things that if you reveal, can destroy the system. Okay, so let's leave journal journalism now, and then we crisscross into politics. Where exactly did you um, strike this romance with politics. I mean, you were a journalist for a very long time, and then now you have crisscrossed into politics, and you're one of the um, stakeholders, as they will call it, today in Nigerian politics. My going to politics was reasonably, again, accidental. When I was given the title of Akira Gwegba uh, in, in Abekuta in um, 19... 88. The whole of Nigeria was present. And the then late or near of Ife, Oba Okolash said, ah, ah, ah. if you can bring the whole of Nigeria from private sector, the likes of Bakatoni, Papa Eseledu, Papa Ogubanjo, everybody were all present. And then in government, the military, virtually the military, the military council, Governors of the Western region, everybody came to Abekuta. So he said, Ah, he thinks uh, the next thing is to be governor of Okuta. Somehow, it was from there the idea that I should come and contest for governorship. So, is this popular saying that for you to go into politics, you have to get your hands dirty? That the Nigerian brand of politicking is a rare one and it takes a lot of muscle and will you know, to be able to practice it the way it's practiced and they be successful in it. And you have so far, so far, I mean, see how long you have come. And you're still there, very prominent and still very instructive in the Nigerian political trajectory. So the question is, what are your pillars that you stand on that has taken you this far in your political journey? The most important factor 
is um, nearness to the grassroots and the nurturing of the grassroots. When I talk of, talk of grassroots, um, it is unfortunate that the two-party system uh, created by Jara Babangida, Ibrahim, Jara Ibrahim Babangida, did not last. It, it, it was a major breakthrough and most important political development in this country. The little to the left and a little to the right uh, philosophy that he created then. In 1990, when I decided to contest, the whole of our ferry, ferry machinery was reined against me. I've consulted them as our elders then. I said, I, we believe, Peter, Felix, and myself believe we have done the right thing. And they went into the field. I can tell you there is no village then in Nigeria, in Ogu State, that uh, I will not be able to mention minimum of four to five families that I interacted with. To, I went to every village, and that was the time of the open pilot system. And I cleared the whole thing. Hmm. And uh, that beginning is still um, what is sustaining me to today. And I did heavy infrastructural facilities, roads, electrification, water system. Uh, I'm not bragging. Uh, my successors will still admit it tomorrow that my penetration of the rural areas in terms of infrastructural development is still a benchmark after late chief Bison Obanjo. I started the payment of work fees for all students in Ogun State so that because you are from a poor family and I can't afford to pay for your work fee, it doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to take the exam. So these are things that uh, will end, that has endeared up to today. Okay, so earlier on I was talking about uh, you know the peculiarity of the Nigerian politics and uh, Nigerian politician. You know, it's it's been speculated that for you to be a Nigerian <coughs> politician, you will have to get your hands dirty. Have there been any time when you got your hands dirty? I will be blunt with you. In politics, there is definitely payback. It has nothing to do with corruption. So you see, you build goodwill over time. And so in politics, yes, there is payback. There are things that you enjoy as a politician. There are things that come your way as a result of those that you have been good to. So uh, that does not mean that one does not need to go and soil his hand. Isn't if that you do well. If it, isn't that also enabling corruption? The same corruption that we'll talk about? No, I don't think so, because I'll give an example. When I was 80, and I launched my book, Where You Are Present, in a quote, eh? the Shaguris, I went there, we, book, we made bookings, um, uh, and we were to make the deposit where Ronald, had that I was going to celebrate my birthday. 80th birthday and told the brother, the brother Shaguri uh, uh, Gilbert, uh, he ordered that everything should be free. Do you call that corruption? Everything in the court that day was free, including luncheon at the sky, you are the sky uh, restaurant. And those that had their uh, meal at the restaurant on the ground floor was all free. The, the everything was given to me free, based on the goodwill that I had built over the years. Would that is that corruption for me to enjoy my goodwill and connection with people? No. I'll leave that for the public to decide. <laughs> so now, um, also looking at this, our Nigerian political, you know, because why I'm asking you these questions is because you have been there, you have seen, and you have conquered, and it takes. It takes a soldier to be able to fight 
and cross many battle lines, as your book indicated. But before we get to your book, let's look at this uh, political culture that we have developed over the years. You see, it will seem most politicians do not have an ideology or philosophy that is binding on their practice and disposition to politics. I mean, in other clients, for, for instance, like America, you would hardly, it's almost unthinkable for a Democrat to cross over to being a Republican, and same for a Republican crossing over to being a Democrat. But here in Nigeria, it will seem like a politician will wake up today and say, I'm APC, tomorrow I'm PDP, next tomorrow I'm, I'm in Labour Party, I'm in APGA, I mean, you know, they just change political identity, political party, like they change their underwear. And the question is, what's your take on that? It's most unfortunate and um, worrisome. But what does that speak to this uh, political ideology? Because, I mean, if you decide, because it takes two to tango, the political parties themselves are also receiving these people who are jumping from one bed to another. So if really these political parties are firm, I suppose that may also checkmate some of these excesses of politicians. Don't you think so? I have hope. The new Electoral Act, if it's implemented to the letters, this electronic transmission of results from the point of auditing uh, accreditation where you have accredited 20 people, the votes will not be more than 20, it can be less. The days where you can now accredit 20 people and then return 100 votes, somehow after this 2023 election will be the greatest landmark. When we start sanitizing results of elections, you will see that it will permeate to the level of crisscrossing and crossing over and over here and there because the voice of the people will now uh, made the difference. Uh, let's hope. Okay, so speaking of promulgation of uh, government of the people, you know, there is this permutation that most politicians these days are all about themselves. You know, the, the ideology of, okay, I'm here to serve uh, is gradually eroding our political culture here in Nigeria. What would be your response to that? I'm not bragging. The, my, the generation of governors of the days of Jack Odebolaige, G.P. Sonobanjo, and Co., Ajasian, uh, uh, Baabe Musa, Rimi, uh, Mbakwe, and Co., a generation that you, you look back and say, yeah, these were people who governed and reflected the interests of the people. You can't say that from some younger politicians of today. But as I said, situation is now gathering momentum. And um, money will not dictate everything the way we are going. I have that confidence and I have that hope. And I pray I leave to see the next election. By the time we go to 2023, which will be very tough, the 2023 election will be tough. And the people will have a voice. And when the people start seeing that they can regain their voices, you will see the differences. And this leads us to your book, Crossing the Battle Lines. In our, the course of our conversation, you have uh, at least uh, revealed some of the battle lines you crossed in your journalistic uh, practice and even in politics. And uh, the question is, um, some people have said that that book is not complete because there are some people you left out. And one of the, one of the personality that people are very particular about is, is IBB. They say you conveniently left his political um, controversies, I mean the controversies surrounding his, his, his political activity. I wrote about June 12, and I wrote about how I had a meeting with him and he said, well, he will recreate the June 12 and give it back to him. And I said, no. And that, that was a breaking point between me and him. And it's all in my book. And I wrote on um, how uh, his government never thought and never wanted Abella to be the candidate. 
And now I worked hard overnight to foil that plan then to get Abella out of the way. What, 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 what do you want me to write again? I wrote about how I was sacked three times under his government and how the government restored. I, I, wrote, so, I, I wrote so much about me and Babangida. Uh, you don't want me to, what else do you want me to do? To start castigating and insulting him? No, no, no. So you won't say you are guilty of being sentimental, you know, as regards your treatment and your presentation of facts and events, you know, as it played out with different individuals, including IBB. Yes, I, I will say it tomorrow. IBB and I are very, very, very close. And we still remain close. But we have our differences. But you see, your Bible have a saying. More iwa, fun odiwa, no more redu. What he says is that appreciate the best in your friends and accommodate their weaknesses. That's how you can create an enabling and sustainable relationship. But for June 12, I believe we will return like Rollins as elected president in this country. I, I will say that any day. The tactical error of June 12 uh, was the greatest thing that I would say is suffered from. But in terms of development in this country, in terms of influence, in terms of contact, in terms of relationship and wide connection all over the country, there are no two IPBs. And you're not speaking from a place of sentiments right now? No, no, I'm, I'm speaking on, 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 on points of facts. He has his weaknesses. The June 12 was the greatest mistake he made. But in terms of even developing this country, the eco bridge, the road, I mean, in his time, the network of roads and things he did, they are all there. Okay, so from IBB, we'll go over to OBJ. There is this speculation that you and OBJ, you know, there is this cold war, it's just like the Russian war. <laughs> You, that you can smile and all of that, but there's a cold war going on between the two of you. Can you throw more light on that? Of course, yes. <laughs> well, um, when I look back, and it's all in my book, I had major confrontation and conflict with OBJ. First, I went into Herald by his making. He was then the chief of South Tropic headquarters. I never wanted to go to Herald because I didn't want to leave three times. But then uh, Chief S S B I wouldn't develop the idea using his uh, knowledge as a good technocrat to say that uh, since the government is having uh, major shares in data, they should send me on secondment to Herald. It's like transferring me. And one of the parts of Kabaka wrote that they should, cause they should inform the then chairman of uh, Data and Aliko, Obadjo wrote and said, no, announce it on the radio. My announcement to Ella was, uh, a problem was made by radio. That's one. Then the sketch, I did an interview. I was appoint, to be appointed my director of sketch. Then a letter was forged that I wrote to inform Papa Wolowo that I'm now going to sketch and I'm going to use the sketch for his political interest in 1979. About was head of state in 1978, he stopped the job. Later, he discovered that the letter was forged. He reversed it, he said, no, the head of state does not reverse himself. He stopped by going to sketch. Fortunately, the UPN that he said was helping, uh, uh, Papa Jassi became governor in Nundu. Chief Bishop of Nundu became governor in Nugu. Uh, like he became governor in Oyo. The very day Bolaghi was sworn in, he announced my uh, appointment as MD of SCAP based on the result that was annulled by the ambassador. So I've always had conflict and confrontation in relation to ambassador. Then I now decided to go, even though I was appointed my director of data by General Buhari on June 12, 1984. So I've always had my problem and conflict with him. So 
But we work with, try to manage ourselves. And then um, when he became president, he was taking his bath in his house at Teco. And I came in the morning and he was shouting, bring me soap for his bath. I said, ah, Mr. President, you are shouting on the people in the road. You know, you know, uh, President Wajo doesn't care. So I created a hill. I said, you must move to this hill. I gave him the library. This was the relationship. At the 2003 election, I did not collect a couple to finance the elections and you know the result of what happened. Yes, the election became very frosty. But somehow, we have been decent with each other. You were there when he uh, launched his library. And he didn't know I would come. And you are written there. You remember when he was reading the speech, he said, this thing would not have happened today if not for Chief Oshoba, who, unfortunately, who is not here. But and then they said, but I have seen, seen Chief Oshoba. That, and then, you know, the old hall started clapping. I got up, took a bow, and they came. And, you know, you remember, he never thought I would be there. Yes, the relationship has been frosty. It's been difficult. And we've managed to be decent with each other. And I can tell you, lately, uh, I've, I've learned to put all those behind me. And uh, we are gradually getting back to in our old age. Why should we continue to recriminate about the past? The past is past. It's gone, it's gone. If I may ask one tricky question, does it have anything to do with a woman? Oh, no, 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 at all. <laughs> uh, because usually, you know, no, from, no. from time in memoria, when two you, people are we, fighting, we, we, a woman is always involved. Yeah, but if you, you go you, back to history, even to the Stone Age, a woman is always in the middle of uh, yeah. conflict between two men. No, so no, is there a woman in this No, in, in this no, no, instance? because <coughs> those are related with those that we... We used to play. I mean, Obama thought did not come into the radar in our younger days. No, so it's, it, there's no woman issue with, between us. It's just that OBJ is OBJ. He believed in garrison politics, garrison you know, all these things, and we we are different. But I can tell you that no, 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 women or anything like to do with women didn't come into our relationship at all. So moving forward now, I mean. Um 2023 is gathering momentum and we're looking at it in the eye. And it will seem that uh, from where we sit and from where we stay now, you've talked about, you know, this electronic transmission, which will also help, you know, in shaping the integrity of our elections and the democratic rule that we have enjoyed so far. If you would want to suggest one or two things, you know, to change the dynamics, as one who has seen, who has gone through the battle lines, crossed many battle lines, as your book suggests, and who is still here, you know, to witness all that is happening today, what would be your recommendations? What would be those three things, three vital advice you would give that, you know, could change, you know, our situation? The first is this culture of selling votes is the greatest problem we have on election day now. Sanitization of the process. In our time, it was open ballot. The train transmission will help that. That's another second process. Unfortunately, the third process that I would have wished cannot happen in 2023. That is... Uh, uh, tribalistic politics. Where, where we are now today, we are back to that divide, the north, the old north, the east, and the west. So I will pray and plead that uh, we should be careful in our utterances in this 2023 election, make it issue-based, and um, ensure that uh, we make it a breaking point for our future politics. Age has become a factor in our politics. I can see you smiling. <laughs> I can see you smiling. 
Age has become a factor in our politics. And the question is, what time or what age, at what age should you take a bow from politics and leave it for others to, to pursue? I don't believe in all this stupid thing that you must take a bow. I'm 83. Do I look to you demented? Do I look like somebody who hasn't got the strength? What is important? You see, in any institution, what you do, a country should build institutions. So, in your own opinion, don't you think that uh, as a public office holder, you should also uh, at least make your, your health status public? Because, I mean, as soon as you cross that line from being a private citizen to being a public citizen, you lose that privilege of having your privacy in its entirety. But we see in the Nigerian culture, um, our leaders are in the habit, in the culture of um, holding information about the status of health. What would be your reaction to that? That I accept. If I, as long as I remain in public, and I put myself up to still serve the people. My life becomes public. That I accept. And that's why I don't hide. My wife used to quarrel with me. In 2017, I had uh, cancer of the prostate. And I made it public. My wife was saying, why should... You see, unfortunately, in Nigeria, uh, we believe uh, in spiritualism. We believe in uh, stupid... Uh, uh, spiritual attack. Now, last year, I had a um, uh, problem with my knee and I had a uh, need for my uh, total knee replacement. I announced it to the public that I was going for a total knee replacement in September last year and I did it. What is the big deal about it? At my age, at the age of 83, uh, the engine, is there a car that to drive up to three uh, and you don't change the brake pad? Is that a car that you, you drive that you don't look at the uh, uh, crash shaft and things? What is wrong in looking at it? I agree with you. Once you open yourself to public service, your life becomes public. Nigerians are concerned about the quality of health of some of the candidates who are vying for very, very critical positions in the country. What would be your advice to these people? Do you think, I mean, it is, it is healthy to have people who are circumspect, you know, when it comes to their health status? Some people don't even want to announce that they are traveling tonight to America. They say, ah, don't tell anybody yet. Don't announce your movement. I said, if anybody's going to spiritually bring down my plane, I'm not going to be the only one that they will bring down. They are going to bring down about 320 people on the flight with me. So, you see, our culture is such that it doesn't encourage you to come out open. So when should you take a bow? Huh? As a political officer? I will never take a bow. Even in, in grave, I will be a reporter reporting my funeral, and I'll be paying politics even as I'm being lowered into the grave. Politics until I die. So, what about anybody wants to come into politics? Let the younger ones come out, like I did. Our younger ones today, we are, we are internet politicians, uh, WhatsApp politicians, group politicians. We talk too much on the group side. And I, I, I'm so disappointed. You belong to a group, somebody's contested there, he's posting his picture every hour, everything, to convert it to people that are the same group. Let you go and do. let the younger ones come out and fight. Nobody appoints leader. Nobody sees leadership to anybody. You fight for it. Let them stop being uh, armchair politics, over tea, over coffee, watching football, and pontificating. Let them come out and be active. So in essence, you're saying that for the older politicians, it's a function of Politics or power is not given a la carte. You have to fight Never. for it. Never. You have to fight the for it. The older people will not seize power. I will, I will not seize being politician. Nobody will drive me out. Let my children know that. I'm not going to rest. I will continue to play politics till I die. I won't retire. I'm 83. But I will be reasonable. What wrong curve would have changed the cause of your destiny if it had happened? If you had taken that path?
Abacha was one major cough that I'm still living today. It's God's grace. Rogers stayed in front of my house for a whole day, waiting for me to come out. If only they had done their intelligence, they didn't, they didn't come and stay all day. They should have come in the evening when I was taking my walk to kill me. They didn't. They missed it on my way to Abekuta. And we got to Ishakamu interchange. The military people at the checkpoint, of course, know me and know my car. As soon as they saw me, they saluted and waved me off. Stop their own car. That was the point at which they lost. They wanted to get to Ishakamu Abekuta Road, empty, clear empty road to kill me. According to Rogers, with evidence he gave in court, on court record. And that stoppage made them not to catch up with me until I got my house in Abekuta. Then there were two attempts. <coughs> they set fire on my house in Abekuta. I survived it because I slipped it. Now, uh, those were incidences that would have, uh, my life would have been wasted and I would have been gone. So when I look back, and that's why uh, I would tell you, a school editor used to tell me that if I do Thanksgiving every day, it is not too much. And that, you know, that I did not end up, and I thank God, another curve was my handling of affairs in government. Uh, as a journalist, uh, I'm trained to keep records and to respect facts. Everything I did in government were all documented in file. I was not one governor who you come to and say, okay, this, 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 and I say, okay, go ahead, do it. Just do everything in writing to me in file. And no file stayed more than a day on my table. So I had over documentation of my actions. Uh, today, I thank God, I did not end up in EFCC or ICPC. None of my, when I was investigated thoroughly under, uh, Ambassador Jones and being a Daniel's um, government, I always defer to all the documents in the file. That saved me. So there are too many calls. In my, and that's why I, I, I gave my book the title Battle Lines, what I went through in life. So there are too many calls. How many will I mention that changed the course of my life today? That um, the most important one was Abacha, who was all allowed to really destroy me. Let's talk about June 12th. What would you say uh, would be your most fulfilling contribution to that June 12th and how it has also shaped the democratic rule that we enjoy today? Too many. For example, in JOS, MK Abella was not supposed to win. There was plenty of booby traps set for Abella at the primary. I'm happy overnight. I drove from about 9 o'clock to 6 a.m. with MK Abella and I in the car and the caller was with me and later joined by Tita Jinoku to go to all the delegates in their camps. That was a major turning point for Abella too. All the governors had instructed their states not to vote for Abella. So we going around the camps late and waking everybody up and Abella addressing them totally changed the tide. I'm happy about that. What about your relationship with Abiola? Your personal relationship and your it political was, relationship was, with him? It was terrible before then. He was opposed to my going to sketch. He wanted me to sack and serve the three times. We were, we were virtually at war. He wanted to be president of the MPAN, Newspaper Proprietors Association of Nigeria, contested against me in 1984. I won. So it was very terrible. But later we said to, uh, when I left it, I was going to politics. I handed over the MPAN to him, took him to Hungary, and made him elected as a, uh, executive, a board member of the International Press Institute. So by the time we got to, uh, I became governor, we had uh, repaired our relationship. Would you say the June 12th has been properly, satisfactorily addressed, in your opinion? 
there is no way you can address June 12 when I mean a man lost his life. Can you ever bring Abiola back? It's not possible. Uh, the dream of uh, a better Nigeria died with June 12 because the two-party system was working well. Like I said, if the ambition of you see, people blame everything on IBB. There were ambitious officers, Abacha and Co, who believed that it was turn by turn. After uh, Babangida, it was Abacha fair, it was his turn now to be head of state. I thank uh, President Buari for restoring the position of Abiola and giving him the uh, GCFR honor, which was reserved for president, recognizing his presidency. But it can never be to, um, unless you can bring Abella back, which is not possible. How do you spend your quiet time? When you're not reading, when you're not uh, politicking, what else do you do? I enjoy my, I thank God for reflection. I reflect on my life and I keep praising God and thanking God. I still enjoy listening to music, when, but not in, in, as passionate as I used to do it in those days. I still love music listen to old tunes, evergreen music and things, well, live a relaxed life, enjoy my time with my grandchildren. As a father, I think one thing I can, one quality I would always say my dad had was that he would always make sure everything you needed was available. So whether or not he was in town or out of town, he would have made all the necessary arrangements for you. As far back as I can remember, he was a workaholic, you know, a disciplinarian as well, a stickler for time. He would always keep to time. If there was one thing that is a bedrock or foundation for excellence for him is make sure you're on time. A guy challenged him about the election of 2003 and asked him why, even though it was clear that he was a front runner, how did he end up losing to Mayor Daniels? And, you know, in his anonymity, all he did was say, you win some, you lose some, and that's where life goes. What do you miss about your about your youth? What do you miss the most about youth? Uh, is that energy, bouncing, bouncing, and um, ability to just traverse everywhere, attend parties, do so many things together. You know? Those things, those days are gone. So who gave you that? Who gave you that title, ladies' man? You know, bag it down. <laughs> and Sam, Sam, you know, you know, Sam is a cynic. A cynic. He, he said, "Yeah, you know, the man where no man, I they kill him." Sam Amuka. Uh, Sam Amuka. He said, "You see, you know, Babangida that knows that he could kill." You got man, Babangida that knows all of us. The one that's going to kill all of us. <laughs> you know. So, on a final note, how do you envisage the Nigeria of your dream that would accommodate and take care of the generation unborn? In my old age, I believe strongly that Nigeria will rise again. I believe firmly that our God has been too kind to Nigeria. We have survived too many things that other countries would never have survived. And that God that has been so kind to us over time, we went through civil war, survived it, not without his own problem. That God is still there. If countries like Argentina totally went under, Brazil went under, Venezuela, Venezuela has gone under, but Brazil recovered, Argentina recovered, Yugoslavia totally went under, and they are recovering, Nigeria will definitely, I believe, and I strongly believe in it, will rise again. Uh, my only appeal is to the young men not to relent. 
They must continue to ask questions. They must continue to agitate responsibly. And they must continue to keep the fight on for a better and greater Nigeria. And I say a big amen to that. It has been a very professional, highly journalistic, uh, with penetrating um, questions. Uh, I have a very good impression and highly exhaustive. I, I can't remember when last I had to sit for five hours to do this kind of uh, historical interview. Uh, a very tasking exercise in terms of recollections, uh, taxing my brain in remembering incidents, events, uh, issues and names. Uh, uh, I'm very impressed uh, and I'm very happy that um, even in today's journalism, we still have uh, uh, a high professional performance and a well research uh, penetrating uh, questions. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Investigative journalist, and I must also say that I'm grateful. And so, on that note, I want to say thank you so much for having us in thank your you home, for, for, for welcoming it's us. A pleasure. We've thoroughly enjoyed ourselves here, and you've shared so much information that will be of help to the children unborn and even us that are here. Thank you for having us in your home.